I must put trigger warning in the title. Just something wrong. The new franchise of the Alanta Falcons will suck forever. I got thunder in my house. She's kind of. I am out at her house now. I just went in her home because I'm so worried about her. This is 30-year-old Matthew Hoffman. He's just been arrested at one of the most bizarre crime scenes ever, filled with something so strange that you'll have to see it to believe it. After sitting in complete silence for hours, in approximately three seconds, you'll see him finally crack and speak for the first time, admitting that a missing 13-year-old girl was found in his basement. I can't tell you anything so. What? But what? Let me... Here we go. What he says next is completely unexpected. When Valerie Haythorn became concerned that something horrible had happened to her coworker after she failed to show up for work, she broke into her house only to find a disturbing scene. VR. Next However, she would soon discover that her coworker wasn't the only one missing, and the truth of what happened was even more horrific than anyone even feared. The nightmare began on Wednesday, November 10, 2010 in Apple Valley, Ohio when 32-year-old Tina Herman, a reliable employee at the local Dairy Queen, missed a day of work. For most people, this wouldn't be a big deal. However, she also wasn't answering any texts or calls, all of which was highly unusual for her. Concerned for her well-being, Valerie Haythorn, Tina's manager, decided to drive by her house and make sure everything was okay. She saw Tina's truck was in the driveway Ohio with another un car and that the lights were on inside the house but Only she GPS still felt satellite. like something wasn't quite right. She called the police and told them that Tina hadn't shown up for work. Sheriff Barber's office. Hi, my name is Valerie Haythorn. Uh-huh. And I work out at Dairy Queen. I'm the general manager out there. Uh-huh. One of my employees did not show up for work this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Okay. You know, which is totally uncharacteristic of her. She's one of my managers. Okay. I drove out by her house and went and knocked on the door, left her note. She's not answering her phone, which is totally uncharacteristic. She's not answering her text, and she is not at home, but her truck and her coat are in her house. Yeah, her truck's there and her uh, coat is in her house. Mods, I'm very concerned about her. What's, you know, what's her name? Her name is Tina Herman, H-E-R-R-M-A-N-N. Okay. Uh, I know that she and her boyfriend are splitting up, and he can be a real jerk with her. Okay. Do you have a phone number for her? Um, oh God, I do, but it's in my phone. I'd have I, to call you okay, back. Okay, that's fine. What was your name again? My name is Valerie Haythorn. Okay. Okay, I will uh, have a deputy swing out there and check on her. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank Anytime. you. Anytime. Uh -huh. All right. Bye. Bye. Responding rather quickly, two different officers at different times showed up to check the residence, but when they knocked, no one came to the door. They left the matter unresolved. The next day, an officer called East Knox Schools to find out if Tina's two children, 13-year-old Sarah Maynard and 10-year-old Cody Maynard, had been in school. Well, thank you for they the were told that both children were in school on Wednesday, like but hadn't shown donation, up on bro. Thursday. Thank Soon, you. a man named Ron Metcalf was also contacting the police what you, because his girl... Oh, don't play with me. What do y'all see a spider at? There ain't no spider on my wall. It's not, it's cold, so there's no spiders at all. Fucking idiot. Girlfriend, 41-year-old Stephanie Sprang, appeared to be missing. She was Tina's best friend, and they'd been together before he lost contact with Stephanie. Ron had last spoken to Stephanie around 1245 on Wednesday, but she hadn't answered any of his calls since then. Around 4 p.m. on this same Thursday, Tina's determined work. boss, Valerie, decided to take matters into her own hands. When she got to Tina's house, she noticed that Tina's truck was okay. now gone. Last pause. Just got to I got to I got to replay this real quick. I'm trying to get a good look at Ohio and what they had to offer and shit like that. Hold on. Ron had last spoken to Stephanie around 1245 on Wednesday, but she hadn't answered any of his calls since then. Around 4 p.m. on this same Thursday, Tina's determined boss, Valerie, decided to take matters into her own hands. When okay. Bro, no Walmarts in sight. No, no nothing in sight, bro. Who the fuck would want to live here? Actually. And what the fuck is, what, what the fuck is he doing in the chat? This nigga just gifted another, he just gifted 30 subs. Yo, thank you, bro. It's like the north part of it. Oh, 
So it's still no Walmarts. What the fuck that mean? <laughs> Richard said this is the north part of Ohio. So North Ohio don't deserve Walmarts and shit. Thank you for the fucking 30 subs. God damn. Thick Darius. Thank you for the Twitch Prime. Big Slime Ryan. Thank you for the five months. When she got to Tina's house, she noticed that Tina's thank truck you, was now gone from the driveway and only the unknown vehicle was left. This vehicle would turn out to belong to Stephanie. When her knocks on the front door went unanswered, Valerie decided to enter the house using an unlocked window on the back porch. Once inside, she saw blood in the bathroom and on the carpet, as well as splattered throughout the home. She immediately left the house and called the police. Wow. Wow. This is Deputy Sylvia, can I can help you. Yes, this is Valerie Haythorn. Uh -huh. I called in last night about Tina Herman being missing. Mm uh hmm. -huh. I am out at her house now. I just went in her home because I'm so worried about her. There is blood everywhere. Okay. Where are you at? I'm sorry. I, I, I just I got back today, so. Okay, okay. So I you just need to kind of fill me in a little bit, okay? Tina Herman works for me. She did not show up right, for work yesterday, and we have not been able to locate her or her children for the last it's been 24 hours now. Uh, I just spoke with her. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. Okay. I just I'm need sorry. an address. I just need an address. Four, four eight one. Uh, Damn, nigga. No empathy. Okay, just give us a few minutes and we'll ha we'll be in round, okay? Okay. okay that's don't go thing. back in the house. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in the driveway. Okay. Thank right, you. No All, right, All right. Bye. 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 By Friday, November 12th, the police were officially investigating four disappearances: Jim Tina, Sarah, so Cody, bad. and Stephanie. The family dog, a miniature pincher named Tanner, was also missing. The house was searched for clues, and the first discovery was very disheartening. The initial crime scene investigation concluded that the evidence indicated assault with bodily injury, including a large amount of blood and what looked like drag marks leading to the bathroom. <laughs> there was also blood on the top of the basement stairs right. and that is in the basement. Look like. Something terrible had happened in Tina's home, but the exact extent of the horror still wasn't clear. The first suspect in the disappearances was the most obvious. Right at the beginning of the investigation, the police were told that Tina and her boyfriend were in the middle of a breakup, oh, and her friends were worried that something may have happened between them. Gregory Borders, Tina's live-in boyfriend, who was not the father of her children, was interviewed immediately after he came to the police station voluntarily. In his statement, he admitted that he and Tina had split up, but they were still living in the house together until either of them could make other arrangements. Interestingly, Gregory normally has Wednesdays off from work, the day Tina went missing, but he decided to work overtime at Target Distribution in West Jefferson, Ohio, about one and a half hours away. Hmm. He worked from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m., but instead of coming back home, he said he stayed at a friend's house in Urbana, as they had plans to what play golf in Bellefontaine the next day. It all seemed very convenient, except that all of his time was accounted for, and his friend verified that they had dinner together and stayed in watching TV. Gregory received a call from his mother around noon on Thursday, and she told him that Tina was missing. But instead of panicking and coming to help look for her, he just assumed she took the day off and continued to golf. Gregory only realized his assumption couldn't have been more wrong when he finally returned to the home he shared with Tina. There, he found that an investigation into the disappearances had already begun. After investigators cleared the crime scene, Gregory's own family arrived with bleach to clean up the blood in the house so that he wouldn't have to see it. With Gregory cleared, investigators had to move on to other leads. The next development was on that same Thursday when Tina's vehicle was discovered abandoned in the campus parking lot of the nearby Kenyon College, with no sign of her or anyone else. But it was something at the crime scene back at Tina's house that soon became the most promising piece of evidence. Investigators found Walmart shopping bags containing two tarps and a box of heavy-duty trash bags. Now, that's not a good sign at all. But in this case, it was also the investigation's big break because, along with the shopping bags, they also found a receipt for the purchase. Detectives wasted no time requesting the surveillance footage from the Walmart in Mount Vernon, and began scouring it for someone making the suspicious purchase of garbage bags and tarps, along with a turkey sandwich and a t-shirt which was seen on the receipt. It wasn't long before they found him, buying the items just after midnight on Thursday morning. Just to be sure they had the right guy, investigators obtained a copy of the receipt from the suspicious transaction and compared the product codes with the receipt they found at the crime scene, and they matched. 
Mm. The suspect was a white male, 25 to 40 years old, with brown hair, wearing a camouflage shirt and glasses. He was caught on the That's footage leaving the Walmart know, in a nah, silver a Toyota sure. Yaris. 100%. Using still images of the suspect, the investigators used the Ohio Law Enforcement Gateway to search for any owners of a silver Toyota Yaris. Them, them it was then that they found a name, 30-year-old Matthew J. Hoffman. His vehicle appeared to match the surveillance video, and in his Ohio BMV hmm. photo, taken only 16 days before the Walmart footage was caught, he was even wearing a camouflage shirt similar to the one in the video. Obviously, the police knew they had to talk to him, but Matthew had two possible addresses. One belonged to his mother, Patricia Heglin, and was only 0.4 miles from Tina's home. The other was registered under his name and was only 10 miles from Tina's. If there was any doubt that Matthew was the right guy, a search of the Knox County Sheriff's Office revealed that he had actually been stopped near where Tina's van was found within the same hour that it was discovered. An officer had stopped him to ask why he was in the area, but believing nothing was amiss, let him go. Why the the Sheriff's Office also revealed that there was also a report of domestic violence between Matthew and his then-living girlfriend that occurred about one month before the disappearances. During an argument, Matthew allegedly choked his now ex-girlfriend. It was also discovered that following the breakup, Matthew had just recently been fired from his job as a tree trimmer for apparently making his supervisor uncomfortable. His ex-girlfriend was contacted and she told the police that Matthew no longer lived at his mother's house and hadn't for several months. Finally, the police knew where to look for Tina, Sarah, Cody, and Stephanie. Wow. Once search warrants were obtained just three days after the disappearances, a SWAT team descended on Matthew's home. Because they weren't sure if Matthew had kidnapped the four people, they conducted a no-knock search and used a ram to force entry through the front door. They then threw in a flash grenade before they entered the home. What they found was more bizarre oh, than no. they could have ever expected. Matthew was asleep on the sofa. He resisted a little by not showing his hands when asked, but he was quickly arrested and removed from the home. As soon as he was taken care of, officers noticed something particularly strange about the house. There were leaves everywhere. The living room floor was almost completely covered in a huge pile of leaves. At first, the police were worried that the leaf pile might be hiding something sinister, like a body. But after searching through, they were relieved to find that this wasn't the case. Still, bitch. things only got weirder from there. There were also bags of leaves lining every wall of the bathroom. After breaking down the door of a locked bedroom, down. police discovered what looked like a marijuana growing operation that was not active. In a freezer, they found two dead squirrels lying right next to a few red popsicles. But the biggest surprise was hidden in the basement. A cabinet was blocking the doorway, the but once moved, an officer discovered that. Tina's daughter, Sarah Maynard, lying on a sleeping bag on top of a pile of leaves in Matthew's basement. Her feet and hands were bound with yellow rope and duct tape. Alongside her in the basement were more trash bags filled with leaves. Thankfully, Sarah appeared to be unharmed, but she was wearing a makeshift diaper made from a plastic bag. As officers approached her, she was very confused and told them that she was late for school and kept asking if they knew anything about what happened to her dog, Tanner. Sarah was likely in shock or possibly wow. dissociating. When something very scary or traumatic happens, someone may dissociate to protect themselves. They may feel disconnected from what is really going on or as though they are in a dreamlike state because reality is too difficult to face. Have you ever gotten in the car to drive home and then suddenly you realize you're almost back but you don't remember the drive? Yeah. That is a very mild form of dissociation. There was no sign of Tina, Cody, or Stephanie anywhere in the home. Investigators took care to photograph the way Sarah was bound before they freed her and brought her upstairs to wait for medical attention. Sarah was then brought by EMS to Knox Community Hospital, where she was thoroughly examined and questioned. Despite the trauma she'd endured, she carefully outlined every detail of what had happened. She said that she and her brother had returned home from school on Wednesday and were attacked by Matthew as soon as they entered. She ran to her bedroom, but Matthew grabbed her and carried her down into the basement. There he found some rope that was already in the house and used it to tie her up. He then left her on the kitchen floor for a period of time. She wasn't sure how long before he put her into Stephanie's Jeep and drove her to the Howard Ballfield parking lot. He covered her with blankets and left her there. 
Matthew later returned and put her into another car and drove to his house. Once there, he bound her hands in work gloves and duct tape, had her gagged and kept her locked in the bathroom in a closet before he put her into the basement. Sarah said that she believed Matthew had killed her mother, brother, Stephanie, and her dog, but she wasn't sure. She revealed that during the time Matthew had kidnapped her, about four days, he cut her finger with a knife, repeatedly assaulted her, and said that he was going to release her before Christmas, but he never told her what happened to her mother, brother, or Stephanie. After being medically cleared, Sarah was then released into her father's custody. Initially, after he was arrested, Matthew was placed under 24-hour watch after crying and threatening to harm himself. Eventually, though, he was brought in to speak with investigators. The following interrogations took place over four days and have never been analyzed before. The interrogator reads Matthew his Miranda rights, but he's almost completely unresponsive and barely even acknowledges the detectives. Bottom paragraph says, my rights have been explained to me and I understand each of those rights. Having those rights in mind, I'm willing this time to make a statement or answer questions. You understand that, man? Yeah. You understand? It's possible that Matthew is in a catatonic state, which can occur with some psychological go, disorders, uh, including schizophrenia. Oh. When the person is experiencing catatonia, they may be completely unresponsive with their body, like Matthew is now. It's also possible that this is his way of coping with the stress of the interrogation. Someone who is under extreme stress may limit their movements in an effort to go unnoticed, also known as freezing. Of course, it's also the possibility that he's refusing to cooperate to intentionally avoid having to answer questions. You want to talk to one of us alone, or do you want us both in here, or are you comfortable with both of us being here? Matt? Soon they start to get creative in the hopes that Matthew will begin talking. Hey, Matt, you... Can I ask you a question? You look familiar. You look familiar to me. You, uh, work out the gym? Though Matthew remains silent, These he finally reacts, Ohio but what he does is one of the most bizarre things we have ever seen in an interrogation. You know, other people, there's family members out there of other people, and they all they want is closure. That's all they want. They've been up for days like you and I have, you know? Heart hurts. I don't. What? I, I don't understand sign language, man. Matthew's hand signals seem to say that his heart is broken. This is, of course, not real sign language. However, it's certainly odd that he's using hand signals to communicate, but this could be an indication of Matthew's childlike nature. What do you want from us? Tell me what you want from us. Matthew sits with his eyes closed as the detectives try relentlessly to get him to start talking. We want a couple of minutes here just to kind of think about all this, because I know it's overwhelming for you right now. I'm beginning to think Matt don't care. He cares. The detectives are speaking as if Matthew isn't in the room. They're likely trying to see if something they say strikes a chord and makes him want to chime in to correct their assumptions about him. When this attempt doesn't work, the interrogator tries another, more confrontational approach. Somebody will cry today if I make a phone call after this interview. Somebody will cry, but I guarantee you, some of that cry will be joy because they know where Cody is. They know where Tina is. They know where Stephanie is. I know they'll cry for somewhat joy, Matt, because I've already heard it with, with Sarah. Matthew tightens one hand into a fist and then covers it with the other hand, a sign that he's feeling very anxious. What I'm probably going to do, Matt, is leave this room, and when I get away from these guys, probably cry like a baby. Because it's working on me, man. Big time. Finally, after sitting in silence and almost completely unresponsive for over four hours, Matthew cracks. I can't tell you anything so I don't know. You know, I, I knew I must have done something wrong. And I found her in my house. She caught it up. And so I took care of her. Psychopaths often try to paint themselves as the good guy or the hero like Matthew did here when claiming that he took care of Sarah. 
This is a sign of antisocial personality disorder, also known as ASPD. Wow. However, when someone with psychopathy does something horrible, they will sometimes pick out one positive thing they did in the midst of all the horrible things Man, in order to claim the that they are squad. good. Let them boys get what at Matthew them. claims he had done to, in his words, take care of Sarah, I need to bring a fire her, squad let her back watch the real. movie Iron Man, do. and allow her to borrow his copy of the book Treasure Island. How do we know anything else? The firing squad and electric chair, we need them. So I was trying to figure out what has happened. Matthew's claim to not know what he did is one of the mysteries with psychopaths and people with severe personality disorders because they sometimes dissociate and can't recall their actions. This is particularly true for the very mentally ill psychopaths such as someone with psychopathy mixed with psychosis. Other times, their supposed inability to remember is just their way of manipulating and pretending that they weren't aware of what they were doing. At what point did you find your tire in your house? White there? ass, white There's, ass water. Did you ask her? Did you speak with her about, you know, what happened? How did you get here? You know, anything like that? She said, I don't know. I figured I had done something I didn't know. I just could try to put pieces together. So bitch ass up, man. It still isn't clear what happened to Tina, Super Cody, or Stephanie, or where they are. However, given the evidence of blood found in the home and Sarah's testimony that she believed Matthew killed them, investigators weren't hopeful that they would be found alive. Did you recognize her as someone that you had seen before? And, you know, did you realize that this is a person you'd seen before that now was in your house or... I don't know. Did make that connection? You don't know her. I mean, I'm just asking because they were the pictures in the camera, and they weren't taken, you know, at the time that this happened. So I was just wondering if you, you know, in other words, if it was someone you knew, and then, wow, why? How are you to get here, my house? Because she said that she asked you a couple of times. Do you do you remember that? I'm gonna thank you for the six months. Childlike behavior is very typical of people with personality disorders, including ASPD. However, Matthew is extremely childlike. When under stress, psychopaths and many people with ASPD often regress to childlike behaviors, but they often do so knowingly as a way to attempt to manipulate their way out of consequences. A female officer, believed to be a psychologist, enters the room and begins speaking with Matthew one-on-one. -on -one. She set up the room differently so they're more side by side instead of across the table, which doesn't allow Matthew to have the barrier of the table between them, keeping his distance and guard up. I think what we were talking about earlier and kind of feeling alone. They got that nigga some pizza. That's definitely when I went to Chicago. I knew no one there. I was the only one out of my class sent there. Um, the interview is transcribed. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know what happened. I just want to make sure that I know what happened. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened possibly feeling lonely in a city where you don't know anyone. This is to make him feel less <laughs> judged. Yo, and start yo can y'all stop putting NGL on everything when y'all say, like, niggas talk about some good eats NGL. Like, what? The, you don't even know what type of pizza this is, this Ohio-ass pizza. Moving him closer to a confession. But you have a purpose. Yeah. Ikigai. NGL. What's that? Japanese. Oh. Ikigai. Mm. He latches onto her comment about a lack of purpose. She'll now likely use this as the theme for why he did what he did as he was receptive to it. This is a step in the read technique of theme development. When developing themes, the interrogator speaks in a soft, soothing voice to appear non-threatening and to lull the suspect into a false sense of security. So I did go out to Colorado after I graduated high school. I did. That's where I got into my first trouble. I did something really bad. And I pieced it together. I figured it out. And I went and turned myself in. That was my first prison time. You know, got no sense of purpose. Oh, yeah. I don't know. It is clear he likes playing the victim role, and the interviewer will allow him to seem like a victim to get him to confess. But admitting that he had done something very bad in the past it shows that he has some awareness of what bad is. So if there is any doubt that he's insane, this could show that he's likely not entirely insane. I guess I burned down a condo. 
What is being insane? What? In 2001, Matthew was convicted of arson, burglary, assault, and motor vehicle theft while in Route County, Colorado. It's believed that he set fire to a vacation condo to hide any evidence that he'd been staying there without the owner's permission. He was eventually released from prison and paroled back to Ohio. The investigator now offers a justification for his actions, saying he just wanted a release and didn't want to hurt anybody. This is another read technique used to make him feel more at ease with admitting to the things he did. As she's proposed a more morally acceptable reason for his actions that he can latch on to. I don't want to hurt anyone. It's not me. Again, her tactic works, and he repeats what she said. You know what antipsychotic medication is? Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't. I read about it. I can't think of what it's wrong. It doesn't directly address the problem. Mm-hmm. It's just powerful it tranquilizers. Take it if I have to. It'll be a <laughs> no, whatever he got on his head is it, it looks. It's crazy interesting that Matthew agrees he will take an antipsychotic medication if he has to. It appears that he may be trying to claim that he is psychotic or was acting due to psychosis when he committed the crime. Crazy. Why do you think that? That is not a hairline. That is a human <laughs> made, made Batman mask. Literally. Again, he's playing innocent and claiming to be unaware of his actions. This is not a believable tactic. And hearing this, it's easy to assume that he's lying and manipulating or playing crazy to try to get out of the consequences he knows he'll be facing. While this could be the case, it's also possible that Matthew has gotten used to dissociating throughout his life, meaning that he copes with whatever unpleasant or uncomfortable feelings he experiences after doing something bad by completely erasing it from memory. This isn't a totally conscious process, of course, because people can't consciously decide to erase something from memory. However, this type of dissociation is something a person can learn to do as early as childhood, particularly people who have gone through severe abuse during childhood. In addition, detectives found an extremely large number of leaves inside Matthew's home. This is certainly unusual and may be a sign of a severe mental health disorder. One of the symptoms of schizophrenia is delusions in which the person may hold strange or odd beliefs. Although Matthew has made no mention of the leaves, it's possible that he holds some type of delusion involving leaves. The sheer amount of time that it would have taken him to gather that many leaves and bring inside lends support to the theory that he likely has a very strongly held belief about the leaves. Okay, potentially, I can't guarantee these things. What facility you might go to you know, where you might go, what might happen. And the, and the, and the attitude that Yo, the people in the system are going to take toward you can be affected by the fact that you decided at this point to do the right thing. The male detective takes what a very different approach with Matthew than the previous interrogator. He's much louder, more aggressive, and more direct. From the moment we broke into your house, found you and found her in the basement, you owned it all. You own it all. Okay? You can't do anything about the part of it you own. Right. Matthew clearly doesn't respond well to the detective's assertive and somewhat aggressive approach. It appears that he's covering his ears with his arms, possibly trying to block out what the detective is saying. He's silent again, and the detective allows the silence to linger in the hopes that he will make a decision as to whether he will confess. The detective mirrors Matthew's posture and body language here. Although this can be viewed as a way of invading Matthew's personal space, It could also be the detective's way of trying to connect with Matthew. The intensity appeared to cause Matthew to become more distressed. However, by mirroring his body language, the detective is relaying a message of understanding. And you know, I mean, if you didn't have a plan and you just put him in the Jeep or you just pulled over somewhere, there's weeds in the Jeep, so it looks like it's probably pulled into a field somewhere and that's how the weeds got on there. If it's a random place, give me an idea where a street it might be on or off of. But you got to be able to narrow the field down from the whole county. And the dumping itself has to be 
less traumatic to recall than all the stuff that went on in the bathroom. Just, just tell us where to look. And I will stand up in court and say that you did. And I will, I will go, I will go to Sarah myself and tell her that you did. The detective returns to this theme that has Matthew looking like a good guy. He even uses Sarah seeing him as helpful as a bargaining chip. I don't want you to get upset, but the reason we're driving around, and we don't have to drive around, okay? Remember, I came in here saying that I didn't want to drive around unless there was some value in it, okay? Right, that's the whole point, is will you see something that will, you know, prompt your memory? But I want to talk about, I want to talk about what, what the possibilities would be for that location. Okay, in other words, not across the street, you're not going to put bodies across the street. What would you do, you know, from there, you know, if, in terms of a place you might go? No, 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 his hairline is fucking terrible, y'all. I'm, I've been spectating it this exactly whole time. It's, you don't know exactly, your memory is not exact. I don't you understand. You have said that you want, you want to know. You're afraid to find out, but, you, but there's a part of you that wants to know. Yo. If it doesn't happen, genuinely, then it doesn't happen. Tech Tone with the upset. 100 fucking gifted. Thank you, Tech Tone. Jesus. If you got gifted, make sure you say thank you, bro. Jesus. That was so unexpected. Thank you, Tech Tone. I appreciate you, man. Thank you, Jimmy White. Thank you for the bits. Matthew seems to like the attention and pampering he's receiving from the detective and the psychologist, who are treating him with care and catering to him as they try to locate the bodies. The detective almost sounds fatherlike as he's talking to Matthew about doing the right thing, almost like a mentor. And the psychologist takes on a nurturing maternal role in her soft-spoken and calm way. Matthew's to severe emotional immaturity appears to have elicited this sort of care from them. You know, drive you, let you see it. Kind of see what happens. I mean, let me ask you, or Chris may ask you an occasional question. But that's all, that's all we're trying to do. Okay? okay. So far, yeah, he got pizza. Check. He's yeah. not cuffed. Um, they're driving him around. They're basically sure. acting like his mom and dad because he, he's, I guess, yeah. all right, do you want to go to the I don't fucking know. I think he's just think a good actor. Okay. Whether or not the police truly believe Matthew's claims that he can't remember what happened to the three missing people, they took him on a ride in an effort to refresh his memory. He didn't reveal anything. It's possible that Matthew simply wanted to escape from the interrogation room, and this car ride was a break for him from the intense questioning. The next day, Matthew was once again brought back into the interrogation room. This is now day four. The detective removes Matthew's handcuffs. Oh, yeah, he been this is a gesture of goodwill in the hopes that he will appreciate it and be more cooperative with them. What the? Listen, he's speed running, eating a fucking Happy Meal. Does that mean you go in the microwave or is it okay? Okay. okay? Giving him food and coffee are gestures of friendliness they hope he will reciprocate. The detective even offers to heat up his food again, trying to build rapport and seem like an ally to Matthew. He's just come out of his jail cell and may be even more receptive to the outside comforts they're providing him. He doesn't say thank you or appear appreciative, which further displays his antisocial personality. You guys just start your day? Yeah, pretty much. It's about 9.30. A little bit earlier. Are you normally an early riser or, or do you stay up late and sleep in? I get up early. This is just to get him comfortable with them again and get him talking. He clearly prefers to sit in silence, so this is essential for someone like this. What are your thoughts today? Well, this is making me hungry. Stendo, thank you for that. Hey. Last night with you. I appreciate that, man. Feeling like you wanted to do what you could to help, you know, help you out. Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I mean, His behavior could point to good. severe trauma you. and or mental defect. The detective realizes he must take some sort of action to get anywhere with Matthew and asks the other interrogator to step out. Chris, you give us a couple minutes? Okay. Did you look at the camera? Okay. 
What are you not turning that shit off, boy? I'll start for you, but I want to give you what you asked for. Okay. Yeah, yeah, Changing the dynamic in the room can sometimes prove useful. The detective slides his chair closer to Matthew, invading his personal space to try to snap him out of the days he's in. This is not unusual for us. I mean, I mean a lot of times somebody wants to talk to one the other. She won't take it personally. Matthew shifts in his chair, positioning himself slightly away from the detective. This may be a sign that he's trying to decrease his feelings of discomfort about the detective sitting so close to him. It's more than one time that I've advocated for the person I'm working with as a result of how things have gone. So when I tell you that, you know, this is what I'll do or what I can't do or... When the detective states that he has in previous cases advocated for the suspect, Matthew quickly looks up and makes eye contact with the detective for the first time since he's been in there. This statement has piqued his interest and attention, an and the detective should take note of this and continue to face, use bro. this theme of him being able to help him. What is that thing? Can you answer? This thing here? On the floor. Well, yeah, it's well that's, all, that's just a, uh, a search uh, a converter that converts electrical current into a current that that computer works up, and that computer is a CBSA, which is a, a type of computer that um, voice analyzes voice stress. It's kind of a, one of the newer types of lie detectors that they use. So isn't the microphone? No. Despite Matthew appearing to be in a daze the majority of the time, this question about a microphone shows that he's aware of his surroundings and he likely has some sort of plan which is why he's wondering if he's being recorded. He's likely not as lost and distraught as he's presented to be. What's the thing in Oh my God. Asking all these questions and shit, ain't nothing wrong with his ass. Just leave it there. Matthew continues to delay because he keeps discussing things that aren't relevant and then asks to use the bathroom. This coffee's kind of getting me to the bathroom. Yeah. They did right. give him coffee no, at McDonald's. That's crazy. Okay. The detective is careful to not turn his back on That's Matthew, just in up. case he snaps and tries to attack him, especially after the comments about the gun. You can even put the gun on if you want. Okay. Oh, yeah, he's tall as shit. What the fuck? Talking about the gun and offering to have the cuffs put back on is a very unusual interaction, to say the least. It could be that Matthew might be aware of his own impulsivity. Perhaps he doesn't trust what he might do in a moment of impulse. The detective took Matthew to a restroom just down the hall from the interview room. <laughs> Narrator making up shit again. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? I feel like I failed you. I'm sorry if I let you down. The detective is saying this as a tactic to essentially place the blame on himself for Matthew not being cooperative to see if that has any positive outcomes. I feel like so to let you down. I've let, I've let Sarah down. I've let everybody down. Uh, what? The detective may be trying to appeal to Matthew's feelings about Sarah. Earlier in the interrogation, he oddly stated that he took care of her. And I found her in my house. She kind of... And so I took care of her. The detective may be hoping that Matthew feels some shred of empathy for Sarah, so he'll provide them with the location of the other victims for Sarah's sake. Everything I've told you has been the truth. But, but I'm being truthful with you now. I mean, it's not just about you, Matthew. Yo, Jimmy it's White, about her. I mean, like I said, I think I failed you. I failed her. Mm. Law enforcement, hey, I failed them before. But, but I mean, that's, that's the package. Did you hear any of our conversation? In, no. In a bathroom? And here now, once I left, I didn't hear anything. Do you want to tell her? No, I was wondering if maybe she had been listening with me. You want privacy, you need privacy. So, are you probably not going to keep that private? Matthew revealed something to the detective in the bathroom that he's concerned the female interviewer will find out about. 
He may feel embarrassed for her to know either because she is a female or because he still wants to appear like the victim as she was previously treating him. Our conversation, like it's a... This, <laughs> this you know, <laughs> Nick in the cut is funny as fuck, bro. He is fucking hilarious. Yeah. My intention, I'll be honest with you right now, is to just tell Chris what we said. Okay? But but I'll tell you this, okay? If you if you tell us, I will keep that private. The detective quickly realizes he now has some leverage over Matthew and uses it to create a quid pro quo scenario. Matthew is yeah, about to unveil a disturbing 13, and unexpected I think. That's why I see revelation. In the say, you fucking freaks. Maybe y'all so even try to hit on every person. girl you see on the screen that you don't know. Freakazoids. Right. Oh, y'all niggas ain't getting no hoes. Fucking. This is really disgusting stuff. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I mean, I could make up some excuse for you guys to kill me. Oh, wow. From what I've heard from their family, that's something that they, that would just hurt them Not y'all, I don't be talking to normal people. The weirdos. You're hurting yourself, it's not going to help anybody, including yourself. Matt said that he had that the dream dealt with the food processing plant um, where they chopped food up and that there were garbage bags there mm -hmm. that were that then he opened or looked in garbage can or bag not sure which and um, he saw you know body parts you know chopped up stuff and I'm not sure what to think now he's basically Terrible telling them what he did stuff. without telling them that he did it he doesn't appear to have any concerns about it. The consequences in terms of I should be a detective. And, and the detective reiterates Matthew's story as if he believes his version of events, but then makes it clear he's holding back additional information. This is to try to get Matthew to disclose the location of the bodies. You should be my girl. Matt. No. No. In terms oh, of no. this deal I'm offering. The last dick. Okay. I mean, so to speak. Okay. What do you think that Matthew did to Tell us what you do remember. I mean, it's, my concern again is was the location. But can you tell us what you do remember? What? Well, you know, you. I thought you should want me to talk about the offer you made to me. What you wanted to have accomplished as a result of the the day, the trip. I figured you figured you already feel that. I mean, you know, in other words, I, you didn't ask me earlier, on his oh, am I going to say that? And I said that, you know, I would not say it. I would not give. See, what I'm figuring is that, that, Chris, I'm not just going to cover this, but I just want to throw something away. I thought that what, your concern was that I didn't tell him about the desire to have us shoot you escaping. Matthew's secret is that he wants to be shot by the detective. The detective agrees to keep this a secret so that he may be able to carry it out. This is all just a ploy to try to get Matthew to disclose the body's location, as he clearly cannot agree to kill him. And that because if I shared that, that then they would go to extreme measures. Clearly, there's no trust on the other side. What the fuck is he talking about? There's no way of proving it. There's Why? no way you can just shoot me with her when you know that. <laughs> if I try to escape, we have a legitimate reason. But what, at the bottom line is, what, what does all this have to do with not telling us where they are? So how does that hurt things? I don't understand. Well, help me understand. It's hard to tell if Matthew actually believes his claim about his dream or if all of this is just him buying time or trying to play crazy. And nobody thinks that the person in this position that comes to this point does this of their own, through their own fault. I'm not going to try and figure it all out, but I mean, I know, you know, your, your dad and mom split up when you were three. You went through a life without a dad. That's a major impact. 
impact. It, it affects a lot of people in a lot of really negative ways. I know your dad was a 40 year firefighter and you set some fires. Okay. His obsession with the leaves and the fact that he accumulates a large collection of leaves in his home could be his way of coping with the abandonment issues related to his father, who reportedly was a firefighter. It's possible that setting fire to leaves, and thus his obsession with leaves, could be related to his hatred for his father or his desire for his father to notice him. People who feel lonely, hopeless, or empty inside often derive comfort from material objects because they might not be able to get the love and attention they want from people in their lives. Well, nobody don't give a fuck As a about result, they turn to obsession and fixations with things in order to feel less alone. In Matthew's case, accumulating large quantities of leaves may have brought him a feeling of fullness and comfort. However, it's also possible Literally, that Matthew may have some sort of mental illness about. and has some strange <laughs> beliefs about leaves. One of the symptoms of schizophrenia is delusions. Yet Matthew doesn't seem to have schizophrenia as he doesn't appear to be in a psychotic episode during these interrogations. When he does speak, he sounds clear, coherent, and he's aware of what's happening around him. He doesn't appear to be responding to any internal stimuli, as you might expect with someone who is schizophrenic. To our knowledge, Matthew was never diagnosed with schizophrenia. With all honesty, Matt, uh, I, I say this very yeah, my genuinely. Daddy used to you be are saying something. Give a fuck. And that doesn't even help you. The female detective calls Matthew out for his self pity and victim mentality. This is a sign that they are done using this theme to get him to speak, mm. since allowing him to play the role of the victim has not produced any answers. Yeah. She then directs him to think about the future and how he'll be viewed in the hopes this will get him talking. Talk to you guys, it's only myself. I don't have any money for it. Wow. She I think you do, and you can. Matthew is intelligent and knows that if he tells them where the bodies are, there's no guarantee of any real benefit to him. The most likely way to get him to give up this information would be in exchange for a plea deal, such as removing the death penalty. However, given Matthew's expression of wanting to be shot, that may not be motivating to him. They're pushing, the prosecutors are pushing to have you come. I've seen a movie where two, a couple got stoned to death, and I'm not going to lie, bro, they could bring that back for people us. like this. Literally. <laughs> um, and well, this is a lawyer prison. Forgot the movie name, though. That's what they're, they're pushing for. Yo, you're saying, yeah, you're, saying you don't, you're, you're still willing to talk to us about it. Starting with you. Back. What the fuck, Brady? You know? What the fuck did I do? pushing for that. So this is your last chance right now to talk to us. They'll come and make the decisions for you. Yeah. I mean, they they literally, they'll take that out. away. They, they make it sound like it's your freedom to go and give you The detective knows that it's very important for Matthew to feel like he is the one in control and he is calling the shots. He makes it sound like if he gets a lawyer, the lawyer will be controlling him. He knows Matthew won't like feeling powerless. And the, the lack of media pressure can also take some of the other people. It's kind of gruesome. It's kind of gruesome what people go through Sorry. before they get into okay. in, into the jail or what they do before they get into the jail. Like, like what you did. So it's like, Keep everything you know. we said in mind for you. Think about it and think about Shit. what you can do for yourself it is what it is. after you talk to an attorney. Here are my pads. <laughs> Man, no, they're gonna, I mean, yeah, they're gonna take you back down to jail because for security reasons, the attorneys can't be with you here, okay? Remember, public defenders have their own interests sometimes, and so, you know, use your head, okay? You're a smart guy. Take care of yourself. I don't know if I have a chance to talk again. You have to anything, bro. Oh, 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 but, uh, no. <laughs> The detective ends things on a friendly note, calling him Buddy, and touches him on the shoulder as a last-ditch effort to leave a positive impression. This is in the hopes that he may at some point change his mind and confess to the location of the bodies. The big question here is, is Matthew's strange behavior in the interrogation all an act either for pity, attention, or a ploy to get an insanity defense? Or is what we are seeing actually the real Matthew? Matthew later revealed that he made up the entire story about his dream about the food processing plant, where he opened a trash bag and saw cut up body parts. He admitted that it was all a lie to try and get himself killed by the police because he didn't want to be injected with Thorazine, an antipsychotic medication, for the rest of his life. He said he still didn't remember where the bodies were. In a written confession, Matthew admitted even more. 
telling the investigators that he'd been staking out Tina's home the night before the attack, sleeping in the woods across the street. The next morning, he watched as everyone left and then snuck into the home through the garage. His plan had been to burglarize the home and sneak away without anyone seeing him. He chose Tina's house because there weren't any close neighbors, and the door was often left ajar. However, Tina and Stephanie returned and caught Matthew in the act. He claimed he ambushed them in a panic. He wrote, I was in a total state of shock. I wandered around the house, slowly coming to realization of what I'd done and how bad it was. During this time, I killed Tina's dog because it would not stop barking. It only got worse because then Sarah and Cody returned home. Matthew attacked and killed Cody before tying up Sarah. Wow. He wrote, I did not enter the house to kill those people. I did not know a single one of them. Shortly after killing Tina, Stephanie, and Cody, Matthew drove to Gambier to collect gas cans from his own vehicle with the intention of burning down Tina's house. It was then that he was stopped by an officer who eventually let him go. He gave up his plan to burn down the house and instead returned to his own, where he built a campfire, burned his shoes, and drank a bottle of wine. On November 18th, Matthew finally cracked and agreed to show investigators the location of Tina, Cody, and Stephanie's bodies. It's unclear if Matthew's memory of what he did came back, or more likely, if he'd been lying about not remembering all along. He described the spot to officers where he dumped the bodies, hidden in the Cocosine Wildlife Area. As the detectives traveled through fields to a wooded area, other officers secured the perimeter. They eventually found a hollow beech tree that matched Matthew's description, which had a hole about six feet up from the ground. There was also a second larger hole near the branches. When an officer looked inside the hole, they spotted what looked like trash bags hidden inside the tree. Wow. Another hole was cut in the tree and the trash bags were examined, revealing remains belonging to Tina Herman, Cody Maynard, Stephanie Sprang, and Tanner the dog. Matthew later revealed he got the bodies inside the tree using the top hole and a rig and pulley system to drop them inside. There's some speculation that when Matthew worked as a tree trimmer, he had hollowed out the tree himself. On January 6, 2011, Matthew avoided the death penalty by pleading guilty to 10 felonies. After everything that was found, it was clear that Matthew had a bizarre obsession with leaves. Forensic psychologists testified that his leaf obsession was delusional, and they believed that he may have hidden the bodies inside of a tree because it was familiar and comforting to him. Matthew Hoffman was then sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. That same month, His leaf-filled home went into foreclosure, and eventually the tree where the bodies had been hidden was cut down. Wow. Wow. 